We're live. Hey guys, it's Michael Coburn with Master the Real Estate Hustle. And you know, I've been looking high and I've been looking low. Each week, I like to come to you with a preferred professional, somebody in the real estate industry that can provide a lot of value to you and help you um, to sell more real estate, to do more deals. And I've found them. Today, we're going to be talking with Juan Arceo, and I'm super excited. But first, you know, I want to give everybody a minute to get on. So I'm going to play a quick intro, and then we'll be right back to talk with Supreme Lending's best loan officer, Juan Arceo. Hold on. Okay, so we're back and we're here with superstar Juan Arceo. Juan, welcome to the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Michael. Thanks super, everybody for being here with us. Super, super excited to have you here. Now, you guys, Juan has been in the lending industry for now what? How many years, Juan? Going on 16 years. I actually started my uh, venture in November of 2004, so it's been quite a while. And it's a great story. So tell us how you got into the lending business. Well, you know, I, I had just gotten married. I was about 21 years old. Um, my mom was a closing manager here at a mortgage company in Dallas, and uh, I was living in Southern California. And uh, she said, you know what? Things ain't really going so great out there. She's like, why don't you give Texas a try? And uh, I came out here in October of 2004. Um, I immediately got up my first job out here at a uh, Target up here off of Coit and uh, the George Bush oh, and uh, was literally stocking shelves, right? And uh, my mom comes home one day and she's like, hey, she says, um, you know, the company is fresh. They're about three years into the business. They need a bunch of help, you know, shuffling files around and, and filing, you know, these files. Essentially, back then it was still paper files. And so they had thousands of files laying around that my job was basically to get in there and sort through by month and year close and kind of just the filing clerk, you know. And one thing led to another. Come January of that year of 2005, um, they offered me a full time position um, in their little setup department. And uh, I started basically stacking files around. A um, couple of years, or well, not a couple of years, maybe a couple of months into that, um, I really started digging into these files and realized what it all entailed and, you know, kind of the financials behind it and the benefit that you provide clients. And ultimately, I just realized that this was the path I wanted to take and I got licensed and I mean, I've been doing mortgages ever since. That's fantastic. Now, how long have you actually been with Supreme? So with Supreme Lending, I'm going on my third year. Um, prior to that, I was with another company that I spent 13 and a half years with. And fantastic. And now Supreme is what? They're doing about nine billion in billion in volume annually. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Annually we're running about nine billion a year in volume. Um, we have a big portfolio too. We service quite a bit of the loans that we do. Um, but yes, we're very well positioned in the market. We're we're a big player out there for sure. That's awesome. Juan, super, super excited. I've heard nothing but great things. I've got a lot of agents that have used you and they talk about there's times that you're getting deals done for them after they've been turned down from who used to be their favorite lender, right? Or their right. favorite loan officer. Absolutely. It happens. It happens with the best of them. You know, unfortunately, there's cases that you might come across that another lender is just not willing to do. And Supreme has a different outlook and, and vision on things. You know, we really put the common sense in the lending. Um, you know, we're not just, you know, about, oh, it doesn't fit this or that. No, if there's a way to make it work, we're all about making it work. That's awesome. So, so let's dig right in then. So let's say I'm a home buyer watching this right now. What's the first step I should take? Absolutely. The first thing we need to do is we need to get you pre-approved or pre-qualified. Um, essentially, that process is going to entail me simply taking an application, which consists of your basic information, date of birth, social security number, your full name, current address, um, and your employment information. Yeah. Once I've got that simple information, we're basically going to pull your mortgage credit report and the scores will vary from what you see online, um, but we will pull a mortgage report. It's what they call a tri-merge credit report, which will show us all three of your credit scores 
from the three big bureaus, your TransUnion, your Equifax, and Experian. When you're qualifying, you're qualifying off of the middle of the three scores. Um, there's not a combination factor. There's not an average of the three scores that you're using. It's simply the middle of the three scores. Um, right. right now, there's a few different options for qualifying, um, but primarily you need to be at least above a 620 credit score on the middle score in order to have an opportunity at qualifying. But once we've got you pre-approved, and again, the process is very simple, uh, we can have an approval letter out within 30 to 45 minutes, just depending on how soon you can get your documents in. And when we talk about documents, it's very simple. Uh, essentially, I need to validate your income and I need to validate your assets. So that entails basically your tax returns, paycheck stubs, and a bank statement. The two, two, and two? Yep, absolutely. It's the two, two, and two. It's what they call the two rules. And it's basically two paycheck stubs, two bank statements, and two years tax returns. That's fantastic. So, hey, you brought up something that I hear a lot on the real estate side, right? And I know there's a huge difference. And help everybody understand when somebody's talking about being pre-qualified versus being pre-approved. Absolutely. That's a great question. And there's a big difference, right? So when we talk about a pre-qualification letter, a pre-qualification letter simply states that you called in, I have reviewed your credit, your credit's good, but I haven't validated your income or assets. And so behind that, it, what a seller's agent wants or your seller's you know, representative wants, they want to see that you've actually been pre-approved. And what that entails is you actually provided me your documentation, me reviewing it and knowing that, hey, there's not going to be any hiccups. The income is there. The assets are there. Everything is in place. They're ready to go. I've pulled your credit. I've checked you out a little bit, seen some numbers. Not just you told me over the phone, you make X and you think your credit's Y. That's, That's cool. exactly right. No, that doesn't work. And it's it's one where we do issue and we can issue a qualification letter. Um, but honestly, nobody really entertains those anymore. Yeah. Um, you got to have a pre-approval letter if you want to get serious with offers. If you're working with a foreclosure, if you're working with reloads, nobody accepts a pre-qualification letter. It's got to be a pre-approved letter. Right? That's right. There's certain That's things right. that they're looking for. I've reviewed their credit. We've looked at their financials. So good. So that's that's fantastic. So moving right along. So we know what the buyer should do. And that was great. So you got to have a minimum of 620 credit score. What, that's right. What type of loan programs does Supreme have for today's buyers? Well, we offer the wide range of products. We have your standard, you know, USDA loans for rural properties. Um, we offer your FHA financing. Um, we also offer your standard conventional financing. Um, as well as your VA financing. Um, in between all of that, um, there's what you would call down payment assistance options. And these work in conjunction with each one of those loan options. So you can have a borrower that's qualified under a VA loan, which is 100% financing, but still needs seller credits and the seller's not willing to pay for it. They can use the down payment assistance in lieu of asking the seller to cover their expenses for their closing costs. So we can do you know, a multitude of things with a few different options that are out there for us. That's fantastic. So the down payment assistance, what's a minimum credit score for somebody that needs to do a down payment assistance program? There's a few different options through the state. Right now, the majority are running at least a 640 credit score better, um, okay. preferably above a 660. If we've got a credit score above a 660, it opens up the door for some better options with better rates um, on the down payment assistance. But nonetheless, I don't want to discourage you if you got a 640 credit score because I'm seeing We've got down payment assistance rates that are hovering in the low threes, um, covering all of your down payment. And that's just unheard of for, you know, anybody that's been doing mortgages for a while. I mean, that's that's insanely good. So when they do these mortgages, the down payment assistance, is that typically like on an FHA, you have the three and a half percent down. So on most down payment assistance, how much assistance are they getting? Are they loans that are three and a half percent down, five percent down? How much are we seeing as for assistance? So, and actually that's a great question. And so right now with the, the downward trend that we've seen in rates, it's opened up great opportunity amongst the down payment assistance programs because originally you had down payment assistance that kind of capped itself around that three and 4%. Um, there's options now that'll get you up to 5% assistance again. And that's that's a great spot to be in. That's you fantastic. can do this, for example, I've got a, a client that I quoted this morning for one of your realtors and she's basically coming in, she's got great credit. So they've got 700 credit scores plus, they're first time home buyers. Right. And the offer that I'm putting them on is doing uh, basically a conventional loan with a 3% down payment using 5% assistance. The 5% so, assistance is coming at a 3.875 interest rate, right? Wow. So on their purchase price, they don't have to ask for any closing costs from the seller. They're basically gonna come in, their 3% down payment's gonna be covered 
and I've got 2% of 250 to give to their five grand in closing costs. They'll actually walk away with earnest money at closing. Oh my God, that's fantastic. So now not just anybody can do this though. Tell me some things that I need to know. If like, I would love to do a down payment assistance program, but do I need to be in a certain uh, income class or what? Yeah, absolutely, yep, you nailed it. So a lot of these programs are, are basically meant to drive home ownership amongst the, the low to moderate income um, you know, population for us. And so essentially, and, and here's the funny thing about it, right? Um, right now, Dallas County considers low to moderate income anybody that makes under $86,000 a year. So if you make under $86,000 a year, you're in line to qualify for down payment assistance. And this applies whether you're a first time home buyer or not. And a lot of people have a misconception that these programs only work for first time home buyers. I've had clients that sell their house are not making a whole lot on the sale. They'd rather pay off some credit card debt with that money and simply use down payment assistance to buy their new home. You oh, can. that's sweet. It's awesome. So, um, so now when you say $86,000, are we talking one borrower or for two borrowers? Well, it depends. Um, if you, if you're going to use both the borrowers to qualify, then you have to use both of the incomes into the calculation. Okay. But there are programs where you strictly take the qualifying borrower. So if you have a borrower that, you know, if you have a, and this is a good example, right? Let's say we've got a couple that combined makes, you know, $120,000 a year. They're obviously well over the income limits, right? Right. But let's say for example, the husband makes under the, the maximum of $86,000 a year and he can qualify for the loan by himself, then we would simply leave the wife off of the loan application and put the loan in his name alone to take advantage of the assistance piece. So with if somebody had the 86,000, what does that qualify them for in a house sales price range? Well, honestly, that's a great question. And there's a lot of factors that go into that, right? When we're talking about simply you know, looking at somebody's housing ratio, there's two different debt to income ratios that you're looking at when qualifying. Right. Um, primarily what a lot of people look at or only factor, or, you know, really the only thing they're concerned with is what they okay. call the back end ratio, right? Well, their back end ratio factors their monthly mortgage obligation for the house payment and all of their monthly obligations that reflect the credit, your minimum credit card payments, your auto accounts, things like that. Um, that back end ratio for down payment assistance right now should not exceed 48%, right? Well, a good number. Now, yeah, that's a big number. And especially when you're, you know, you're making six grand a month, you know, 48%, you know, you can go up to about $2,800. Now that's your back end ratio, right? That's all of your debts combined. When we're talking about the housing ratio, which is a very important number, because this is the number and percentage of what your house payment is eating up of your monthly gross income. This number can go as high as about 39, 40%, depending on how good the credit is. These loans are approved through what they- Hello, did I lose you, Juan? Juan, I think I lost you. Let me see if you can refresh his internet here. I think your Wi-Fi froze. Juan, if you can hear me, recircle your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Hold on, give us one more second. I know, here, I'll tell you what. Well, I get Juan rolling. If you guys do have any questions about home financing, uh, here's Juan's phone number. And also you can go to him online at juanthatloanguy.com. Give me one second. I'm going to uh, make a quick call. I'll get into All right, I gave Juan a quick call here. I th he's going to have to log back in and we'll get right with you. So that's a lot of great information, right? On loans, Juan is super, super sharp. He'll be right back with us. But the down payment assistance program is a great one. He talked about FHA. I know FHA right now is 4048 in Collin County. So if you want to buy a house in Collin County, you can buy up to four hundred and four thousand eight hundred dollars and i got there he is one 
Welcome back, baby. So welcome back. Okay, so a little technical difficulties. Thank you for hanging in there with us. So Juan, you were just saying, uh, and so the front end we can buy as, as much as 40% of the payment? Right, that's right. So your debt, to, your debt to income ratio for the housing ratio can go as high as about 39, 40%, depending on how strong the file is. There's a couple of things that really, you know, are, are key factors in understanding, you know, these differences and things that we're talking about, right? When we're talking about, you know, approving a loan, right? A loan is 99% of loans nowadays are approved through an automated underwriting system. It's what they call an AUS, right? Um, and essentially the way it works is I have to basically take your application. I have to import it into a system along with your credit report, all your income data, everything will cross over and it simply reads everything. And based on your risk level, it will approve it wherever it, it feels deemed fit, right? So you might have somebody, and this is a great example, you might have somebody that's coming in at a 640 credit score, which is the low tier credit score for what they're entertaining, right. that has a debt to income ratio at 39%. They don't have any money left over after closing. The automated system's not going to guarantee them an approval because it's going to read that there's layers of risk there that ultimately push it into a denial, right? Or asking for additional reserves, meaning that they want to see monies that you have left over after closing. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. And so one thing that, you know, I really like doing is kind of, you know, playing with the system to figure out where it's going to max you out, kind of figure out what tweaks we need to make, whether it's, hey, I need you to save a thousand dollars so that you at least have a grand after closing, whatever it may be to where ultimately the system, you know, will give you an approval. We can run the system as many times as we want, right? So I can go in there and play with it until it tells me yes. And then if that works <laughs> for you, we'll move it forward. There you go. So you mentioned 640 a lot. So is that the minimum credit score? I mean, is there something you go like with an FHA? I mean, I've heard people talk 580. Are those days over? Yeah, honestly, since COVID hit, um, you know, there's been a, a change in lending with regards to, you know, investors and feeling a little weary per se about, you know, the economy and the market. Um, you know, honestly, it's it's been a blessing for, you know, the mortgage companies out there because essentially this has created a massive influx of applications and opportunities for people to save, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest with right. the rates dropping the way they have. Yeah. And so it's been a big blessing for everybody that's been able to take advantage of it. And, and not only on the refinance side, but on the purchase side, because people don't really realize how much 1% in interest will do to your purchasing power, right? Oh, so if you, were buying a, yeah, if you were buying a $250,000 house last year at a rate at four and a quarter, and that was your max, you're coming in today at three and a quarter, I could easily probably boost you up to 275. That's a big difference in, in what you can find in the house, right? It doesn't sound like an astronomical amount of money, but as a home buyer in the market nowadays, and your realtors validate this, $25,000 difference in price can be a game changer in the home and the quality that you're looking at. Especially at the 250 price range, we need to pay 275 just to get our contract. To get the offer. That's exactly right. <laughs> I had one out in uh, Port Arthur, which is down south, uh, just over the weekend. They called in on Sunday. Um, started working in approval for them. The house was listed for $150,000. The contract got accepted at one seventy four. That's insane. That is insane. That is insane. So that's awesome. So uh, we talked about pre-qualification and pre-approval. And how how long are these pre-approval letters good for? I mean, I've seen people, they're showing houses four, five, six months, and they give me a letter. I'm like, this was last December. <laughs> That's a great question. So when we're talking about your, your pre-approval or pre-qualification letter, whichever one you're issued, uh, with Supreme Lending, those are valid for 120 days. Um, and essentially, it's not the date that the letter was written. It's okay. the date that your credit report expires. So if I pull your credit today and I issue you an approval letter tomorrow, you've got basically 119 days. So right? you can use that same credit report. It's not like you got to pull them again later. So no. whatever happens, whatever makes underwriters like want to do a a repull right there before closing or funding what well it, here's what happens is you have what they call lqi reports and these are basically refresh reports to your existing credit report and essentially what happens is about 10 days before closing um, they will run this report and what this report validates is whether or not there's been any new inquiries on credit for new credit extensions credit cards auto loans installment debt things like that um, and it will also validate to see if there's been any big changes and the balances that you've charged. Because if those minimum payments change, it can affect your approval. So let's say, for example, I give you an approval letter today, you had a Chase credit card with a $500 balance and a $10 minimum payment. 
but then 10 days before closing, you just charge five grand and that payment's down 250 minimum. Oh, I had to buy a new couch. <laughs> it happens. It happens. I'm gonna tell you it happened. I've had some weird ones out there, you know, and so ultimately it will affect your approval because we now have to factor that in. There's what they call the ATR rule, right? Or your ability to repay the loan. Right. And I, I deal with this a lot with consumers, especially consumers that are very asset heavy. Um, a lot of people don't understand the fact that after our last recession, and I was writing loans back then, so I've, I've lived it, I lived through it, we all were there, right? Yep. And so with that, what happened was, is that consumers came back in after everything you know, went down and basically said that lenders didn't qualify their ability to repay this loan. And the excuse behind that was, for example, you can have somebody that had $5,000 in collections that we didn't account for because they were negative in collections, right? But now what they do with this ability to repay rule is we have to factor debts in there that you might not even be paying on. So for example, if you're qualifying for an FHA loan and you have outstanding collections that are non-medical, I have to count 5% of that outstanding balance as a monthly obligation against your income, right? And this is to avoid you coming back later and saying, hey, Juan said I was fine, right? Yeah, but now yeah. I can't make my payment because I've got this $50 collection payment I gotta make, right? right, right. And it prevents that, right? And so it's really prevalent when you're talking with asset heavy people because I had a client that called in yesterday and uh, the guy's got over $300,000 in the bank, but he's on fixed income, right? And so ultimately he's trying to buy a $350,000 house and he's, you know, essentially telling me like, look, man, I've got over 300,000 in the bank. I can make this payment. And it's like, no, man, you've got $2,000 in social security income. You can't make that $2,500 payment, right? right? Regardless of what's in the bank. Right. And so it, it kind of, you know, has thrown a, a wrench into things, but honestly, it's always been for the better um, because now everybody that obtains a mortgage is truly in a position where they can afford it. That, you know, I want to talk about one thing. Now, everybody, as you know, right? When buyers and sellers enter in their contracts to buy and a buyer wants to buy a house, the lender has requires them to have an appraisal. Now that appraisal is not done for the borrower. It's in protection of the borrower, but really the lender is doing that for protection of themselves, right? That's right. And so I'm seeing a lot of loans these days where lenders are going, hey guys, we can forego the appraisal. We don't need to have an appraisal. Should buyers think that's a great thing? Or should they want that appraisal anyway? You know, in my opinion, when you're buying a property, you want the appraisal. Um, you know, the appraisal is a professional opinion of what the value of the home is. And I'll tell you that, and this is, you know, it's, it's a touchy topic because it happens all the time, right? If I take a, a, an application today on somebody and I'm fixing to order an appraisal and I give that same appraisal order request to 10 different appraisers, I'm going to get 10 different numbers. They're not going to match. They're all going to be different. Why? Because they're human and it's right. their opinion of what the value is. Right. Does that make sense? Not so an exact time, science. What was that, Michael? It, it's because it's not an exact science. That's exactly right. There's certain there's certain methods to the madness, right? There's certain, you know, numbers that they have to plug in to create an adjustment. For, yeah, there's certain things that they have to, you know, follow, but for the most part, it's always left up to the professional opinion, right? And so with that, you know, if you're buying a home, 100%, get that home appraised, right? Because even between appraisers and inspections, right? Your inspection is great. Your appraisal just serves as a second inspection. Because if that appraiser goes in there and notices, you know, some, you know, maybe fault crack through the walls or something that your inspector didn't notice, he's going to note it in the report, which is just a protection for you to, hey, get an engineer's report, make sure that the home's sound. Um, and if there needs, you know, work to be done, then let's get it done. You know? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with all that, especially if you're doing things towards the lower end of the spectrum, houses under absolutely. 350, right? If yeah, you're absolutely. buying properties much higher than that, I think when somebody's putting 20% plus down or the market has just gone crazy on fire, these guys are, are, are doing drive-by appraisals because they're realizing right. that these properties are of value. There, yeah, the value's there. And, and that's the that's correct. 30 and the, the house. Yeah, and honestly, it all is tied into, you know, the rule changes that we've had, you know. So after the recession happened, you know, of course, you had the whole HVCC rules, right, which stands for Home Valuation Code of Conduct. And what that does is prohibits anybody within the transaction, myself, uh, my processing team, anybody within the transaction from communicating or discussing value with an appraiser, right? 
So I can't even talk to an appraiser on your property until he submitted a report to me. And then I could question him like, hey, my client feels this is off or whatever it may be on a rebuttal type deal. We can you know, go after him that way. Right so, now, what's most prevalent with these drive-bys is on your refinance transactions. And the reason why it's happening is because after the whole meltdown, right, Fannie Mae now keeps all of the appraisals that are done, right? They have them on record. So all this stuff is already recorded into this database. So when we run our desktop underwriter, which is that AUS system, that automated underwriting system I was talking about, yes. a lot of times what will happen is if it feels the value that you inputted for the property is a, a respectable or a, a deemed correct value for that home, it'll issue you the waiver and it'll say, hey, you know, uh, DU accepts the value as is, no appraisal required, right? And on a refinance, that's great. And, I don't and, have to money. I'm working with a buyer too. I'm like, yay, that's yeah. great. Save me yeah. $500. And exactly. I, know, I think, I don't care what the appraisal comes back on. Right. I want that house, right? That's exactly so right. If you're buying a house for 500, it comes back 475. The seller doesn't want to reduce and I don't have enough money. This brings up, this happens a lot. Absolutely. And I think it's happened more since COVID are appraisers actually trying to account into the market jobs and economy when they're looking at values of properties? Are they thinking that, well, this has a tendency to maybe be a declining market per se, you know, yeah. like it used to be, you know, and, and honestly, that's a great question. I personally don't see that. Um, I think what we've had is just to simply slow down for a couple of weeks. And I think we, and you talked about it a couple of months back how you know, right between that February and March, which is kind of like our ramping up time in the, the real estate mortgage industry, right? Because you're getting all the, the spring and summer sales going. But, you know, I remember talking and having that conversation where, you know, after as soon as COVID hit, it seemed like we were dry from that whole February through, you know, pretty much about April, right? Yeah. After that first lift or that, that first initiation of, hey, we're starting to open back up is when we've just seen an influx of business. And I mean, oh, it's, it's just crazy. been, it's, it's crazy. been crazy. It is crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's a blessing for everybody that that is truly able to do something in this time. COVID has the world turn upside down. But if you're in a position where you're financially stable, where your job is secured, you're still working, you're still making money, you better take advantage of these rates because they ain't going to be down forever. They can Absolutely. jump at any time and your opportunity just went out the window. You need to buy an investment property, right? So Absolutely. I, I talk to people all the time. Every time, you know, you find out somebody just had a new child. Hey, we need to put, we need to get little Billy a college fund. They're like, what do you mean? We need to go find an investment property, put it on a 15 year note. And by the time little Billy is ready to go to college, you've got a property that's paid off. That's bringing you a monthly income or you could sell it and invest in his college. Absolutely. And, and honestly, I mean, if, if think about if you were able to do that for your children, like if you were able to get into something right now and set them up in that position, you know, when they're 25, right? And now they've got a steady stream of income that honestly, if that rent started out when they were babies at, you know, $1,200, it's going to be 23, 24 by the time they get there. That's a 20, you know, $6,000 a year income. Absolutely. That's about what he's expected to make fresh out of college. Right. You know, you just doubled them up. Right. You know, doubled them up. Yeah. It's awesome. So, so give me some, uh, Give me your, give me a final thing. I know I'm not going to keep you all day. I already know Juan's like closed almost 20 transactions last month. He's on fire. And I told him, I said, I promise Juan, just give me 30 minutes of your time. So I'm not going to keep you all day, but do you have any final remarks or statements? If they're a realtor, what, what would you, what advice would you give them? If they're a homeowner, what advice would you give them? You know, honestly, uh, to my realtor friends out there, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of you guys. Um, you know, it's always a pleasure working with you guys. I'm here to help you guys. Um, if there's anything I can do to make your job easier, to put more money in your pocket, that's what I'm all about. Um, you guys know my wife's a realtor. I know what you guys go through. I know how crucial each deal is to you guys. Um, and I truly value, you know, every client that you guys send me, whether it works or it don't, right? I've had you know, Karen, she's a sweetheart. She's already sent me like 12 people and we still haven't closed one. And it's just like, girl, just keep sending them. They're going to close. Right. And it all is just, it's a funnel, right? We just have to keep feeding that funnel so that ultimately these deals keep coming back to us. That's Whether right. they don't qualify today, it's okay. We'll get them with our credit guy. They'll hook them up and get them back to us when he's ready. And then he's coming right back to you and you'll get paid. Right. Um, if there are out there, let me throw something out there. But you're a, you're a banker, so you got bankers hours, don't you? Work maybe like what from nine to noon? I mean, what are your hours? If I'm a realtor, need to call you. 
Do I only got like a seven hour window? Right. I, you know, it, honestly, my hours are from eight in the morning until eight at night. My dialer starts at eight o'clock in the morning. As soon as eight o'clock hits in the morning, I'm already dialing people, whether it's the clients you send me or just the third party leads that we have coming in. Uh, but my day doesn't stop when I leave the office. I'm available from eight to eight. I've had plenty of you realtors call me on a Sunday afternoon and I'll take your call. You can text me. I've had conversations with your realtors at nine o'clock at night. It's no big deal. I understand that these transactions, timing is everything, right? Absolutely. Especially when we're in this multiple offer situation, because if we can get in there a couple hours before and get that contract executed, that sleeper that waited till the next morning to submit that offer, he lost. We that's right. Won, that's right. right. And that's what it's about is winning. That's right. So what about to the consumer that may be watching this on our show today? Um, at what interest rate would you say they needed to have where it's worth refinancing now? Honestly, it's a, it, it depends. It really does. And it really depends on your credit level. But if you've got good credit, good credit, anything above a 680 credit score, and you've got an interest rate above 4%, you need to call me. 30-year um, rates are hovering as low as 2.625, 2.75, just depending on the day you catch it. That's I quoted a 15-year the other day at 1.5% on a 15 year on a 15 year, that's free, money. That's free, it's free money. money. It's free money. That's Whether it's one and a half or three percent, it's free money. It's Take it while you can because it ain't going to be there forever. When I bought my first house, one I had an 18 percent interest rate, and I was doing the happy dance. Uh, and we got 1989-90 when I refinanced at 13 and a half. <laughs> yeah, and hey, I'm that I'm that guy too. When I bought my first house in 2006, I had a seven and a half percent first lien and a 9.99 second. I got into those 80 20 bad credit subtime days. That's me, right? I made it happen with that. I um, luckily, that. I was able to refinance it later, and I got a sweet deal now. But ultimately, I mean, sometimes you just got to start off high and come in low later. I love it. Well, hey, Juan, thank you very, very much for being here with us today. We appreciate all Absolutely. your insight, all your expertise. You're awesome. And hey, anybody out there that needs a good lender that's hardworking, honest, going to shoot you straight, tell you straight up, yes, they can or no, they can't, or this is what you got to do. Because one thing I do know is Juan's got some great credit programs should the credit need a little bit of repair. So reach Absolutely. out to Juan at the number you see there below or go online to one that loan guy.com and he'll hook you up thanks for watching tune in every tuesday at 1 30 and we'll have some more great real estate professionals and remember thanks for having me michael you're very welcome Juan. Juan, remember this you're great where you are you're just too good to stay there have that's right baby i love it love See it bye-bye